Jane. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Hey, um, we're here at Stonewall Farm today, and I thought maybe we could look at the greenhouses. That's a great idea. Yeah. There's a couple different kinds of greenhouse here, and so we could look at both. It's a nice day. Yeah, it Good. is. It's a little foggy, but the sun's going to burn off, and we're going to go out and, and check it out. Now, we're going to go into the greenhouses today, and we're going to go into the dome as well as the hoop house. So there's educational opportunities in the dome as well as in the hoop house. In the dome, they have educational programs for um, school kids that come in. They'll teach them all about plants and how the whole thing works. And then in the hoop house that's behind us, they'll grow tomatoes and other vegetables and prepare for the season in the spring and in the fall. Good. Do you hear? I do. What is that? I think that's Amanda coming up the hill. Let's go check it out. We'll be right back. <laughs> So that's Amanda in her tractor. So what I understand is this morning she's been working out in the gardens out in front of Stonewall Farm and she's been doing some mowing. Amanda, how are you doing? Great. How are you, Jody? Oh, I'm great. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm out glad here. you could be here today. I know you have a lot to do today. Yes. So right. I, I think you're going to do some mowing. Yeah, and then... the kale and then an old planting of dill and cilantro yep. mowed in so we can seed some more fall. Excellent. Yeah, because I see that they're working in the greenhouses mm -hmm. this morning and they're getting some plants going. So yeah. why don't you do your thing? Okay. And then we'll go out and head into the greenhouses and see what Jenna and Sarah are doing. Sounds good. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jody. Good. Thanks. So you're done, huh? Yeah, okay. yep, just real quick. Cool, cool. So I see that we've got some plantings here, mm -hmm. and these are going to go into the garden? Uh, they're actually going to go into the second greenhouse mm -hmm. that we're going to be building ah. in the next couple weeks. Um, yeah. Some fall, kale, chard, scallions, all things that are pretty hardy Great. that we'll do fine in there Excellent. into December. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah. you have try to have things, have things all year yeah. round pretty much. Absolutely. That's great. Yep. That's great. So right now you've got tomatoes in the greenhouse? We sure do. Okay. So I think Sarah and Jenna are in there right oh, now. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take a look in. Great. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Wow. This is so cool. I've never seen tomato plants this tall before. This is really great. So here we are in the greenhouse with Jenna, Sarah, and Amanda. And Amanda, I know you've got to get back to work, so we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Sounds okay, good. cool. So Sarah, I would really like to see more about this, and I think Jenna and you are going to have a little converse about some bugs, because that's what Jenna really loves. I'm excited. There's yeah. some really neat ones in here today. Cool. Yeah. So let's take a look. I think the bugs are down there. Yep. All right, yep. let's go. So tell me a little, Sarah, about how this is structured. Like, why are these tomato plants on these, um, what do you call them, trellises? Yeah, yeah, we call it a trellis system. Um, we grow them vertically. Uh, tomatoes by nature want to just sprawl out on the ground. They, they don't want to climb, so we have to help them do that. So we grow them vertically and we try to take off any of the axillary shoots like this would be and just keep a terminal shoot so that it grows in one straight line. It's better because it allows the plant to have more space in between rather than getting really full and bushy. Um, and then that allows for better air movement. And you can grow more plants in a space as well, I imagine. Right, right? by growing vertically. Right. Yeah. And what kind, how many different kinds of tomatoes do you have in this greenhouse? I think we have about 10 different kinds. They're mostly heirlooms. Um, we chose one kind that was a hybrid for disease resistance to kind of have that as an insurance, but we're just so in love with the different heirlooms and the flavor that they have. That you wanted to have all those different choices. Yeah. Now, are you selling these at the market or are they part of the CSA or both? Both. both. And as well, they're sold in our farm stand. Oh, great. Yep. Now, I, as I look around here, I see so many tomatoes. I mean, it's just amazing to stand here and see all the different kinds of tomatoes and so many of them. But this is um, an organic greenhouse, right? right? Everything that's grown in here is grown organically. Right. Um, and I've actually heard just from other people that are trying to grow organically that it's sometimes hard to have a balance of um, pests because you can't use the chemical pesticides and don't want to, obviously. Right. So how do you kind of work that out with um, different pests that you have and trying to keep the tomato plants healthy? Right. Well, we choose, even though there are organic certified, you know, sprays and pesticides, we choose not to use them, which is just a personal choice. Um, and then 
I mean, we mostly have a threshold that we tolerate to with insects and we try to have, you know, precautionary measures, which is by rotating. Unfortunately, we can't rotate in here because this is our only tomato house, but with other crops we rotate. Um, well, and I noticed there's not anything on the ground other than the tomatoes right. growing. Is that part of it too? Like yes, no absolutely. grasses or? Mm -hmm. You don't want to create a habitat that insects will want to, you know, live in. And so we try to keep the the soil very clean and sterile and we have the the um, landscape cloth on the edges just to keep out more deter weeds some of those weeds yeah have you had any particular problems with pests this year yes every year we've been noticing more and more tomato hornworms like and you show are there any around yeah I'm guarantee we'd find one I know they blend in because yeah. they're you know they're a pest that yeah, wants to there's one right there so that is a tomato horn let's see if we can get it off um, They've got sticky little pads. They're huge. Look they at them. are huge. Boy, it's hard to get it off. So how do you spot these? I mean, they're so blended <laughs> in. Is it? Is it? Um, it's one of those things where you can, you know, see the damage. What are they? What kind of damage do they cause? Yeah, you want to look for the the main signs, which are damage. And this plant's a perfect example. It's nibbled off all of the the leaves on the terminal. Oh, I see. Um, he doesn't and then, want to come off. No, <laughs> and. So the other sign is uh, basically their poop. Uh, it drops down from where they've been munching, and um, and you can we'll tell because that's got to be some some big, um, yeah, big poop. <laughs> they are. Yeah, insect poop is called frass, frass. and so when we see it, um, often I'll see it in the forest from forest pests. But because I don't grow tomatoes, I wouldn't have thought to look for this. But I mean, I imagine it's all around. Yeah. Um, now, what kind of damage? So they're chewers. They have mandibles. Yes. And these will turn into a really pretty big moth when yeah. they're all done. Um, now, what kind of things would control this? I mean, we're, you're, you said you're not spraying, so what, right. do you, what do you do to control them? We pick them. You we pick them right off? We high and low about once a week or maybe more, and we pick them off. And is it just you guys that do that, or do you have some help? Well, this summer was excellent. We have camp that here for seven weeks, and the camp kids have a, about a 15-minute chore every day, and mm -hmm. when it's garden chore, they would come up and they would search for hornworms. So and do they, they what do they do with them? They have a perspective because they're shorter, so little lower. they can look up underneath the plants. After they would, they would take them off. They'd put them in buckets and we feed them to the the ducks. The and ducks, the ducks like them. They love them. That's great. <laughs> so that works out well. Yeah. Um, I know there are some natural insect predators and parasites of the hornworms. Yeah. Um, particularly parasites yeah. because this is such a large insect it would be hard to have an insect predator coming to eat it. Right. Um, have you have you seen any like, parasitic wasps or anything like that? We have. Yep. We discovered what we thought were maybe even hornworm eggs and then we looked it up and found out that they were wasp eggs being laid on the hornworms and so when we found those worms we left them alone so that the wasp eggs could hatch. Yeah. And do their parasitizing. Great. And, yeah. So maybe we can find one that's been parasitized. We'll take a look, we'll look around and yeah, see. Let's look. Because anytime you have a, a population of pests, you're likely, if you're not using sprays, to have a population of parasi parasitized um, insects as well. When you use a spray, you're off, often going to also kill the parasitic right. insect that it's might beneficial benefit insects. it. Ah, there's one right here. Oh, that is beautiful. Now, the reason I say that's beautiful is because <laughs> these, all these little white, these are actually pupa or cocoons right here of, oh, it's, oh, look, it's just moving barely, of a parasitic wasp that comes along and it has a really long needle-shaped ovipositor, which is its egg-laying tool, mm -hmm. and it puts it right into the insect um, and lays eggs on the inside. And then the larvae feed on the tomato hornworm. Then when they're ready, they come out of the tomato hornworm, and this tomato hornworm will not survive to adulthood, which is great news for you yes, guys. Yes, yeah. it's very good news. <laughs> um, and, but all of these pupa will be an individual parasitic wasp, which is great, because then all these other tomato hornworms uh -huh. that maybe you haven't found or your campers haven't found to pick, yep. these insects will come out and search for more places to lay eggs, and they yes. will lay them, hopefully, in all these tomato hornworms that have yep. maybe gone undetected by, the, by you and the campers. Yes. So that's great. This is a reason that you really don't want to take this guy off, nope. right? No, we're going to let him be. And he's not going to cause much problem, many problems for us. No, I mean, look this. at how small. <laughs> I mean, he's, um, what's nice here is that this tomato hornworm obviously isn't nearly as big as the healthy one we found down the row. Yeah. And he's not going to get any bigger. He can't possibly survive because he's been being eaten by yeah. all of those little um, tough way to go. larvae. Yeah, but it's great. <laughs> it's great news. And another reason that you don't want to 
spray anything because you'd end up killing those. Right. Yeah. The other thing I found while we were walking was, um, is oh, this the fr the frass you were talking that's about? It. Yep. That's okay. of a smaller smaller caterpillar, but. And so that is some some pretty big frass for an insect, really, because this yes. is a huge insect. But that's a good way to find it. We just, I just looked on the ground and uh -huh. and then we found it. It so. starts bright green, which obviously resembles the leaves, and then yep. as it ages, it it, it turns gets brown. brown. And yeah. so what do you do? You just leave it down there. We leave it down there. Leave it down there. Fertilize. Fertilize. <laughs> Perfect. Great. So it's this is looking good. I mean, if you're if you have you have all this production in here, you've got parasitic insects. It's wonderful. It's yep. wonderful. And if and hopefully by next year they will have really made an impact on that population. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So Jody, I don't know if you got a good look at this wow. tomato hornworm. It's a caterpillar that will turn into a moth. That Isn't it is just amazing? Huge. Just huge. Yeah. Now, you remember that we did see one that was parasitized. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the actual insect that parasitizes it. I mm -hmm. had this in my collection, which is why it's on a pin. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a parasitic wasp, and you can see that sort of pointy structure on the abdomen. That is its ovipositor, which it will stick into the body of the hornworm, the soft body of the mm -hmm. hornworm, and lay eggs inside it. Okay. So again, um, the one that would come out of the hornworm, oh, it's actually eating right now mm. while we watch it. You can see its mandibles munching away. Yeah. Um, the one that would come out of the hornworm, of those little pupa that were on it, would be much smaller than this. Mm -hmm. But this one is nice because you can actually see the different parts of it. Wow. Amazing, wow. isn't it? Wow. It is. Now, what are the stripes and what are those little dots on the... Um, there's the dots on every segment of it are actually the opening to the outside for the insect's breathing system. They mm. don't breathe through their mouth like we do. They have little tubes. It's almost like a, a system of straws branching through their body. And these are the openings to the outside. They're called spiracles. Wow. Every insect has them, but you can really, they're marked on the tomato hornworm. Mm -hmm. yep. And then this, these lines, uh, Sarah was telling me that she was talking about how these lines on the body really mimic the veins on a leaf, make it really hard to see them. They really do, because I was looking in the greenhouse and I couldn't see that many until I really took a close look. Right, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was a really neat thing to mm -hmm. see in the greenhouse. Okay. Ah. So I think we're going to go over to the other greenhouse, and I hear they have a pool and goldfish. So let's check, check it, it out. out. Yeah. Right. Wow. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thank wow. you. So, Amanda, please tell us, what do we have here? Um, a little bit of everything. So, the dome has kind of gone through some transition over the years, just trying to... I've never grown in anything like it before. New England and New Hampshire, we're in a zone 4A growing zone. So, you know, that takes us to a certain temperature in the winter and it accounts for the cold climate that we have. Well, this dome, the way that it's built and the way that it's structured and all the different components of it make it more of like a grow zone of like a 5, even a 5B. It's a whole new territory for me. So we originally had it all in, in peppers and we saw a lot of disease, a lot of insect problems, a lot of aphids. And so we decided for this year that we were going to go completely different and we were going to um, put in trellises for cucumbers. We were kind of going to grow in layers and then also we were going to grow a wide variety of things, specifically um, medicinal and culinary herbs that won't overwinter outside, things like rosemary. We're going to do some tarragon in here. Um, perennial flowers that wouldn't more tender varieties, things that wouldn't necessarily make it outside. And so far we've had great success. I yeah. mean, we've overwintered rosemary in here, which is a very tender perennial. So it's, wow. it's doing great. We also have some flowers in here yeah. just to attract more beneficials. Mm -hmm. um, it's turned into quite a fun space. Yeah, yeah. So in the summer, mm -hmm. you have to keep it cool. And in the winter, yes. you have to keep it warm. So right. how do you do that? The summer has actually proven to be the most difficult of mm -hmm. that, if you can believe it. Um, it actually gets really, really hot in here. Um, so the best thing that we've done is just keep the doors open, keep the fans running. Um, and I don't know what it is about this year, but it's actually kept cooler in the 90s versus the 110s that mm. it's been in the last couple of years. Mm. So maybe just the, I don't know, the whole system is a little yeah. bit healthier this and year. Do you think it might have something to do with that pool that I was talking about? It might. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the difference has been the last couple of years. Um, maybe I've been more on top of keeping it filled, yeah. but definitely the tank has a lot to do with yeah. um, regulating the temperature in here. So let's take a look at that pool. Sure. Okay, yeah. let's go. Okay, so Amanda, I see some goldfish in here. I know yes. that that's not what you're really growing here, but no. they, look, 
but they they're really interesting. They're really fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have a big tank of water, so you might as well mm -hmm. do something fun with it. That sounds um, great. And the, the tank is so that, um, it's kind of like living on the coast. It, it regulates the temperature a lot more. So all day long, it absorbs the sun, and then at night, it slowly releases that heat, mm -hmm. which is a really huge component for why it can stay so warm in the winter. I mean, it, it, the coldest it ever got was 28 degrees wow. all winter long, which is pretty amazing, even on those negative mm -hmm. nights. Um, and then, you know, you walk in here in January and it's 60 degrees because yeah. the sun is shining. Yeah. So. I've been here in the winter it's and amazing. it's a beautiful little uh, gem so that you have something that's warm and beautiful exactly. and green and growing. Exactly. So, yeah. And a lot of our, our winter CSA produce comes out of here. A lot of mescaline, arugula, Swiss chard, beet greens. Um, I know we have, a, we have a lot of perennials in here, but we also have space for a lot of that mm -hmm. annual quick greens growing. Yeah. So it, it's a really fun space to be in in yeah. January. Yeah. <laughs> so let me back up way to the beginning. Sure, so sure. So this greenhouse has been here for what, like three years, three, three or four years? Yep, three okay. years, um, 08. We put yep. it up in the fall, a whirlwind of a week. Yeah. Um, we bought the kit um, from Growing Spaces. They're out of Colorado, I believe. Um, and up it went. And it, it's designed to utilize and maximize sunlight. Mm -hmm. So it's oriented so that the tank is on the north side of the greenhouse with mm -hmm. this reflectix mm -hmm. so that as the sun travels across the sky, it reflects off the reflectix and into the tank. So everything is kind of focusing the sun's rays onto the water. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, other contraptions around that uh, maximize. So along the outside, those beds underneath, you actually have drier vents. And there's two box fans that actually pull the warm air, for the warm air from around the tank and then blow it out into the, the headspace of the, mm. of the dome. Um, the beds are built off the ground. Um, all the vents have a beeswax tip at the end that as the beeswax warms, it expands and opens the vents. So it's a completely solar except for the water pump. Mm -hmm. It's the only wow. thing that is not solar in the greenhouse. So um, no heat other than the actual sun, which wow. is pretty, pretty awesome. Very efficient. Very yes. efficient. Sustainability. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, working on it. Yeah. So you have the hoop house. Yep. You have the dome. Yep. And you're going to have another greenhouse going yep. up. And that's going to be used to lengthen the season? Yes. Okay. Yep. And what do you think that you'll be planting in there? So my goal is to have the second hoop house up the beginning of September. And immediately, we, we started the seeds today. We're going to put uh, kale, chard, broccoli rob, um, and spinach in there. And so that will hopefully be harvesting into December, hopefully to Christmas. Mm -hmm. Christmas is my goal. Mm -hmm. um, and then it'll really stop growing with the lack of sunlight over the winter. But then starting in February again, we'll see a lot of growth and Excellent. so we'll be able to cut it. Yeah. And then the tomato house is going to be transitioned to greens right away in October. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, and then you're yeah. going to start seeds and the whole process seeds gets started start again. Seeds start in February and yep. it's, yep, another yeah. year. Great, great. Another well, this season. has been wonderful. Good. And I'm really glad Good. that we've had a chance to come out to Stonewall Farm I'm and glad see you the greenhouses. Too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for coming. So what, if you're interested in more information about In My Backyard, you can email us. And our email address is inmybackyardch8 at gmail.com. We're interested in having students come on. Um, it's really interesting to understand you know, all kinds of things that are happening in the Monadnock region. Absolutely. So if you've got an idea, please email us. And we'll see if we can get you uh, to come and visit, um, just like Amanda did here at Stonewall Farm. Great. So thanks. Thank you, Jody. All right. We'll see you again soon. Great. OK. Thanks.